office. I am the executive chef here at Roth Living in Denver. Um, so I will be conducting tonight's little chef's table experience where we basically dive into all things Sub-Zero, Wolf, and if we really need to talk about dishwashers, we'll talk about dishwashers as well um, because it's not quite as interesting, but we do like to talk about them because they are a remarkable product. So we definitely want to give you some information on that if you are interested in learning about the Cove and the newest member of our little Sub-Zero family. So um, we'll cover just about everything we possibly can when it comes to Wolf cooking. We will certainly talk about Sub-Zero and how having one of our preservation tools in your own kitchen um, will really make a huge difference to the way you cook, the way you eat, and in many ways, just the way you live your life. Um, it can really have a change for you as well. Um, hopefully, there's no food sensitivities or allergies tonight. If there are, you have the menu in front of you. So if there's something you see on there that says, oh, Lord, if I eat that, I'm going to have to break the EpiPen out and stab it into my thigh. Um, please let me know so we can make arrangements for something else. Um, and then we want you to ask as many questions. And that goes for the people online as well. Um, just use the chat feature on the Zoom call. And then Lynn will direct those questions to me in real time. So I will try to also repeat questions from the assembled group here today as well, so that if they have a question that you need to know um, what they need to know, um, I'll try to make sure that, that all of that is laid out for you. On all the way through the presentation, we're going to be cooking and serving and eating all of this good food. So hopefully everybody brought an appetite with them tonight. Um, and so we'll, um, it's Tuesday. It's kind of a weird night, right? I mean, Tuesday is one of those nights you don't think about going out and having a four course meal on a Tuesday, right? It's just not one of those things. Maybe we don't think about that at all anymore. I don't know. So, um, but, uh, but we'll try to um, just make sure that you guys can um, enjoy everything tonight. So your first course, and I'm going to make a plate of it over here just so the people online can see it is a, uh, is a tempura of uh, fresh avocado and zucchini. And that is served on top of uh, well, for lack of a better term, it's really a salsa, but it's just a very chunky style. It's also a freshly grilled peaches, sweet onions, a little bit of fresh tomato, and then some roasted poblano chilies in there as well, um, just to kind of round it out. It's almost like a salad, I guess, if you will, because it is a nice vegetable course. So we've got that there, and then we've got a little more garnish back here. So if you guys haven't met her already, which I'm sure you have on your way in, Lynn Thielen is in the back. She is our showroom manager. She is also um, running the, uh, the broadcast tonight. So um, she'll be here as well. And so if, if anybody has questions about design or maybe you need to make an appointment to come in and, uh, and learn about our appliances in a one-on-one -on -one consultation with one of our showroom consultants, Lynn is the lady to speak with, she can set that up for you. And one of the great things about our showroom, if you don't know this already, but we are a 100% no pressure, no sales. We don't try to sell you anything. We just trying to give you as much information as you could possibly hold and therefore learn that maybe Sub-Zero and Wolf and Wolf Coves are really the brands for you um, in your own kitchen. So um, if you haven't made an appointment for that, I would encourage it. It's a fun way to come and spend a long time if you choose to. It could be up to three hours, sometimes longer, um, depending on whether you bring plans or designers and things like that. It can You can spend quite a long time, but we're happy to do that for you here as well. So that's really what we're about, is about just spreading all that information out to everyone. So anyway, so Lynn is in the back. We also have uh, Brenda and Nicole are here as well. They'll be the ones giving you more water or if you need an extra glass of wine or something else to drink, please uh, don't hesitate to call on them. That's what they're here for, just to make your evening a little more enjoyable, okay? So um, we again, we'll talk about, like I said, all the, the, the brands, but what we're really gonna focus on is cooking and what Wolf cooking appliances can mean in your kitchen. And when we talk about Wolf, we talk about mastering heat transfer, because that's really what cooking is all about, is controlling the amount of heat right, that you're gonna provide to the food that you're cooking so that um, you can predict the results at the end. That's really what it's about, is just getting the, the results that you need, that you want, right, out of that 
process, right? That's having that kind of control, being able to master those functions. That's going to make cooking a very enjoyable experience because you're going to be able to predict how it's going to come out, right? We don't want to just roll the dice each time we try to cook something. We want to have some confidence, right? We want to know that we're going in, our appliances are going to behave the way we want them to behave. We're going to tell them what to do and they're going to do it, right? And that's really what um, wolf cooking is all about. So we'll talk about those four ways of mastering heat transfer, right? And those are the four primary ways that, that wolf kind of harnesses energy to, to create great cooking appliances. And one is induction, right? Everybody knows a little bit about induction cooking, right? Who's interested in induction? When is that something that really grabs you? Why? Easy to clean. That's the first answer I always get, right? I hope that after the end of tonight, you'll say, not only is it easy to clean, but it has the same functionality as a gas range, right? I can get the highs and the lows. I have the control, right? It's not an electric range anymore where when you turn it off, it's on for 30 minutes and you have to move the pot off, that kind of thing. That's what I want you to say at the end of tonight. It's not just easy to clean, but it's really great to use, right? So induction is one way we'll talk, one way of mastering heat transfer, and we'll talk about that tonight. The second way, obviously, is going to be what I really think Wolf is known for and what it's really, really good at, which is gas, right? Cooking on gas, whether it's our dual stack burner technology, or we're talking about our infrared griddle or our char broiler, all of those ways of cooking, right? Harnessed in one appliance, or maybe it's a combination of appliances, but where gas really excels um, and why Wolf is really mastered you know, that gas uh, technology. And then we're gonna talk about convection, dual, dual fan convection or dual verticross convection, right? Everybody knows a little bit about convection, right? We all know that it's probably good for us. We're not really sure exactly when we should use it, but convection is one of those technologies that's it's out there. Um, all of our ovens are convection ovens, right? We're, we're, we're fully embracing that, but we've taken the convection system and we've, we think we've improved it and made it really the best in the industry. And then the last thing that we're going to talk about when it comes to Wolf cooking products is the convection steam oven, right? Everybody heard of the convection steam oven, right? You know a little bit about it, just enough to say, hmm, is that for me? Is it, am I going to have to relearn every recipe I've ever done, right? That kind of thing, right? So convection steam, we're going to talk about that. We're going to we've cooked some things in it for you, so you'll get to sample that and see what it can do. But I'll go out on a limb right now and tell you that I think the convection steam oven could be the most impactful appliance that you put into your kitchen. You'll find that I think within six weeks of owning a convection steam oven, you'll be using it 80% of the time that you use an oven. That'll be the oven that you use. It'll, it'll become that essential to your cooking repertoire. So I think you're going to enjoy that as well. And then we're obviously going to talk about Sub-Zero. Right? And we're going to talk about just how miraculous this appliance, that's what started the company off back in the 1940s, right? when um, Wesley Bakke moved to Madison, Wisconsin and opened his little freezer company in Madison right? and started building freezers, commercial freezers. Um, and then I, you know the story a little bit. He was eventually approached by a, very, a young architect in, in Wisconsin whose name just happened to be Frank Lloyd Wright. And he said, Hey, I'd like you to design a refrigerator for me that looks like the wall. I want it to disappear into the architecture. I don't want to see it anymore. Can you do that for me? And Wesley Bakke did, and the Sub-Zero Corporation started then making refrigerators that were built into the appliances and henceforth has been known as sort of the, the leader in sort of that technology, that seamless um, technology of, of blending it into your architecture and, and so you can you can say, well, find the fridge, right? It's, a, it's one of those tricks, right? Um, and, and the beautiful thing is, is that, you know, still made in Madison. The company is still headquartered there. It's still owned by the third generation of that family. So it's an entirely family-owned company, all built in the United States. We don't build it in Madison. We're building it down in the deserts of Arizona. Um, we built some of our wine storage units in Arizona, along with some of our undercounter refrigeration and our column refrigeration. But just about everything else is made right there in Madison at the factory in Wisconsin. So we'll talk all about that. And again, please, as many questions that you have, we really want them, right? I want you to, you know, just make sure that you're asking as many questions as you possibly can come up with, right? So what do you think of our little 
salad, right? What'd you think? So Lynn, I have one. This is for Lynn. So all right, you like it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So let's talk about induction, right? We've already had um, Kip, right? And Sean talking about their interest in induction, right? Because it's really easy to clean, right? So we have two forms of induction over here, right? We have um, one that just turned itself off, but that's okay. Um, the beautiful thing is you can just turn it right back on. Um, we have two induction um, pieces of equipment here that we're going to demonstrate for you tonight, right? One is our induction cooktop, and then we have our teppanyaki grill, which is an induction grill. So for you folks watching at home, and if you can, if you want to see a really good up close, you can also look at the, the video monitors behind me. You'll see close-ups of what's happening if you're getting a kind of a, a, a slightly not great view on the camera, although Lynn is probably doing a great job, you know, getting zooming in over here. But let's talk about what induction is all about. And um, when we talk about induction, we're also talking about, you know, again, mastering that heat transfer. And when we talk about heat transfer, I always like to ask this question. I think it's a, it's a fair question, right, to start off talking about what heat transfer is all about. When we're talking about what is, what's the, what, what does sugar taste like? It's sweet, right? Is it anything else ever? Sugar, right? No, I mean, it's, there's not very complicated, right? Sugar is basically just, it just tastes sweet, right? We can't say that it's got, you know, overtones of floral this or, you know, we can't say those things. We can just say it's sweet, right? Okay, so on the opposite side of that spectrum, what does caramel taste like? buttery it's also sweet yes but it has a flavor is it i mean i always think of caramels kind of nutty right like toasted nuts or it's just it has that kind of that burnt flavor just on the edge of burnt but not bad burnt not like you know the kind of burn you scrape off your toast because it tastes like just carbon right no it 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 needs to have that sort of just on the edge of you know bitter a little bit bitter right on so you guys know sugar, right? One molecule, it's one molecule, it's no more, right? It's a few elements together, but it's one solitary molecule. How many molecules do you think there are in, a, in carbon? I mean, in a caramel? Just a wild guess. 100? Yep, no? 756, right? And it's all sorts of things, right? Now, what do I add to sugar to make caramel? Well, butter, yes, you could, but it's not absolutely necessary. What's the one necessary ingredient? Hmm? No. Heat, exactly. It's heat. Because I can just take a pot of sugar, put it on the stove, right? Add heat, and over time, that sugar starts to change color, and it, it starts to have an aroma, and it's all of those things that we start to associate with what caramel tastes like, right? It's a little bit nutty, it's a little bit smoky. It's all of those flavors coming together because all we're doing is adding heat. But what happens if I let the heat get away from me? I end up with burnt, and burnt is bad, right? And if I can't control it, right? If I don't control that process, right? Then I lose control of it, and then I end up with burnt sugar, which is not pleasant, period, right? It has to go in the trash. Just like burnt garlic, right? You can't, you can't resurrect burnt garlic. That flavor is forever. Just like burning sugar, that flavor is absolutely forever. Never goes away. So I need to be able to control it, right? And what's been the problem when most people, when they look at a range like this, right? When they look at this, you know, induction range, what do they see? What's the point? They don't know it's induction. What's the first thing that most people see? When they, when they look at this, they say, hmm, what does that look like? Right? What's this look like? Right? Everybody's had one at some point. You had an electric range, right? Everybody's had one of those. I did. I hate to say it, but for about 18 years, I had to live with one of those in my house, right? And I learned how to cook on it because I did this a lot. Kept pushing it off the burner because I wanted to stop it from cooking, right? Well, here's the beauty of induction like gas, right? Because when gas is off, it's off right? Induction is the same way. Wolf induction is the same way. We have control. We have the ability, right? Right now, both of these burners are on. Everything that you see in front of you is cooking 
but it's cooking it the way I want it to cook. I'm not having to muck with the burners. I just let it go. It, it's holding a simmer. It's holding temperature. It's doing all of those things. That's one of the beauties of Wolf induction is that it gives you the same control that you get on a gas range. If you need to bring something to a boil quickly, induction is the way to go. It's going to be a lot faster than gas, super clean, right? Heat transfer is very, very, very efficient. Right? So we know a little bit about induction. It's magnets, right? And electricity, the magnets get turned on. We have fancy pots. The pots get hooked up to that magnet. And then what happens is the magnetism between the pot and the range makes the molecules in the pot run around really, really fast. And when they run really fast, they create friction and the friction creates heat. So then we heat up the pan, but not the burner, right? So the burner's on, I can put my hand on it, but it's not gonna burn me because the heat is really from the pan, not from the burner. So this gives us that chance. And then when we're simmering, right? Here we've got some, it's a beautiful simmer here in the back, right? And it's just holding really, really nicely, nice and hot, not scorching the bottom of the pot, right? So we can do that on induction because it has that sort of ability to control the heat, to master the heat. So we can predict that these really expensive grits from South Carolina, right, are not going to scorch and not going to burn, right? They're just going to be creamy the way I want them to be, right? And that's one of the beauties of induction because it gives you that kind of control, the wolf induction in particular. So let's add these. This is tassel ham. So you can see why people love induction because you just wipe this down with a towel, right? How easy is that to clean, right? That's, now that's easy, right? Yes, shoot. Well, you can't char a pepper on an induction burner. So if you want to roast a chili on your live fire, can't do it here, unfortunately. Um, we obviously don't have a char broiler, right? We don't have a gas grill, if you will. And there, although you could put in an electric grill if you wanted to do a module like these um, and have a module grill next to your induction cooktop. In fact, we're gonna use now our other induction piece, which is because quickly becoming one of my more favorite pieces, which is this teppanyaki grill, right? Now, teppanyaki sounds like a fancy thing, right? But what is teppanyaki? Everybody been to Benihana at least once, right? So you've been to a teppanyaki restaurant when they had that, giant hot table in front of you and the guy flips the shrimp into his hat and all that kind of stuff. I'm not gonna flip any shrimp into my hat. A, I'm not wearing a hat. And B, um, it just would be gross. Um, anyway, but a teppanyaki, an induction teppanyaki is essentially the answer to having a griddle, right? To make your pancakes, to make your grilled cheese, to do all sorts of different things on, but you don't have to worry about having a gas appliance. You can have a, an induction appliance to do that on. So it's a fun thing to cook on, right? And it's, you treat it just like a griddle. You're going to use a little bit of oil to cook on it, but it gets a nice even heat, right? So we're going to add a little bit of oil to that. And then we've got some shrimp here. And you can see how it works as an induction burner is that the the stainless steel plate that's on the top is actually taking the place of the pan, right? We don't need a skillet or a saute pan. We just need this hot metal plate to cook right on. So it gives us the ability to have a lot of fun, right? Because I love this kind of cooking because it really does take me back to working in restaurants and having, you know, that giant hot, you know, uh, plate right in front of you. Um, you don't have to worry about the pan all that good stuff, we can just cook right on it, right? And one of the things that this teaches us, right, when we're cooking on this is it teaches us a good cooking technique. And that cooking technique is we heat up the metal and then we add a little bit of oil and then we add our food and then we don't play with our food, right? That's the way you learn patience. You don't play with your food. You let the appliance do its job, right? And the appliance does its job because you preheat it properly, you add the oil properly, and then you just let it cook until it releases it naturally from the teppanyaki, right? So now you, can you imagine all the things you could do on this at home, right? Let's say you wanted to just, you wanted to sear some steaks because it's the, 
like four nights a year that you just can't light the grill. It's just too cold outside to do your grill, right? But you want to cook a bunch of things at once, right? So you can use your teppanyaki to do some browning. Maybe you want to make some grilled cheese sandwiches. You can put probably, I don't know, four, at least, maybe four, maybe six on here simultaneously and just let them cook at the same time. And it'll hold an even temperature. That's the beauty of it. It's very, very even front to back, right? We'll see the same example of this when we talk about gas cooking, that we have our, our infrared griddle can do exactly the same thing, but it, except it's using gas as a power source instead of the induction. So again, here's just another way that you can diversify the way you cook. You can control that heat. And if you see on the screen, you can see the little control back here. I've got them bridged. So if I want to move the whole thing down, there's actually two distinct zones on here, but I can do one or the other. I can now bridge them and do the same exact matched heat and just control it that way. So again, you're not moving it until they're ready to be moved, right? Then when they don't stick, then it's time to flip them, right? You don't want to force them. You want them to release naturally. And as they release naturally, they will have caramelized and browned beautifully. And even from front to back on the teppanyaki. Has anybody explored the idea of doing a teppanyaki at all? Has anybody ever heard that we actually made one of these? No, right? So it's a pretty fun little appliance, right? You don't want to do gas, but you do want the idea of having some of the functionality of a gas griddle. This is a fun little appliance to work with. Because of the hood? Okay, I'll step back from the hood a little bit. So again, just letting it do its cooking, right? You're gonna get a little bit of, see if splatter on there, but again, it was, it's again a, an easy way to clean up, but just letting it cook. Just so you guys know, when you're cooking shrimp, I had a gentleman ask me this a few weeks ago. He said, how do you know when shrimp are cooked? Right, I have no idea. I'm looking at those shrimp, I'm like, I have no idea if they're cooked or not. So think about shrimp like your arm, right? When, when the shrimp curls all the way and your, your hand touches your shoulder, they're overcooked, right? You've stretched all that muscle. So it, right, that, that, that's all that is, right? It's just pure muscle in the back. So it's just, it's all tight and tense. So you want it to just be at about 90, a little over 90 degrees in the bend, and then you're good, right? That's when you know your shrimp are cooked, right? They'll turn nice and opaque, but you don't want to overcook them. So it doesn't take too long. I find that lots of people, they overcook their shrimp a little bit. And so it gets a little, a little chewy, a little rubbery. Okay. Can you see how easy this is? And when you're cleaning up, it's super easy to clean up. So again, just like the, the induction range gives you a lot of control, a lot of high and low, right? So really does um, give you the first met method of the way we master heat transfer. Let's get you work with peace of mind, right? I can sit here and talk to you cook this, cook this, but I'm not worried about this scorching or these burning, right? I'm having, I have that amount of control, right? So it's real easy, you know, for a lot of things, a lot of companies, they can give you a really powerful burner, right? But power is not any good unless you know what to do with it, right? You have to be able to control it. Like just having a lot of heat usually means you just burn a lot of stuff, right? So uh, that's, that we don't, we don't want that. We want you to have the, the control over the food as you're cooking it. So. All right, okay, so let's just grab a plate here and we will make up this plate. Let me zoom out a little bit, pan over. You don't want to see me, that's for sure. Let's just go here so you can see, all right. Alrighty. Okay. Hey. 
spoon. So this is just a little fresh tomato coulis. A tomato coulis just means that the tomatoes were never cooked. They were just marinated, allowed to sit overnight, let them marinate, and then, oh, can you, um, Brenda, will you bring me a little bit of the corn relish, please? So one of the cool things that you can do in your convection steam oven that, that we don't have time to do tonight, which is you can do your own preserves, right? If you like to do canning or anything like that, you can put up preserves in your convection steam oven. So we used this last summer, right, to make an Olathe corn relish with the fresh Olathe corn, right, and some other crisp vegetables. Let me just put that, a little bit of that corn relish on there. And a little bit of garlic chives. So again, there's our first Thank you. So again, the best way you can take care of your induction griddle is just once you're done cooking on it, you're gonna turn the heat down a little bit and just do, there's a little kit that you can get just for scrubbing it clean, but it's really easy to maintain. Doesn't require a lot of special tools or anything like that. You just need a little bit of cooking oil and one of those scrub pads and you can just clean it off really, really nicely. It's very, very easy to maintain. So let me just pass these over. The girls will plate these up for you. All right. So any questions about induction? Anybody have some questions about induction, cooking, anything like that? Nobody's now swayed. They're automatically going to go and get induction. They're not going to get a, you're going to get induction. Everybody else is going to get gas, right? Because you're like me. You're a, you're a dinosaur like me. I like to see my heat. I don't like to imagine it. I like to know where my heat is coming from. I can see the flames. I can't see any heat here. I know it's there, but it's kind of nice and reassuring, right? To know. You know, to answer your question about what you can and can't do between the two, the only other real difference between the two, and this is not a huge difference, is that on gas, you have unlimited flame height. You can dial it exactly where you want it. With induction, there are basically like stops on the railway. So in other words, there's only wattages that come up in certain increments. Now, we've given you enough low end wattage, right, so that you can do a nice simmer, a gentle poach, something like that right? But you're kind of locked into what we've determined. I don't think it's going to change the way you cook. It's not going to be a, uh, uh, you know, a, a, something that you're not going to be happy with. The only nice thing about gas is that you can really micro adjust it if you into that. So um, anyway, it gives you a little bit more flexibility. So, well, speaking of gas, let's, we're going to skip gas cooking right now. And we're going to talk about convection and convection ovens and all of that, because I think everybody, you know, has an idea about, um, let's make sure I get, there it is, right there. So what a convection is all about and why do we need it, right? So what's the first thing you think of when you hear convection? Even, even heat, right? That's really what convection was designed for. Do we remember, because a lot of people, the first thing they'll say is, oh, convection makes it, lets you cook faster, right? Let's you use lower temperatures, right? It's all those things about energy savings and time savings and all those kinds of good things. But really what convection was about was making sure that you could cook something in the top of your oven and the bottom of your oven at the same time. And you didn't have to like take this one and move it around and spin the tray, even the oven cavity out. Make it so the entire oven cavity is utilizable, right? It's there for you. And you're not having to do any special things when you're cooking in convection. It's there to even it out, right? So convection has been around for a long time. Some very smart person thought if I add a fan to the oven, it'll make the oven more efficient. All of those things then turns out it can become more even. So Wolf said, well, we think we can take it one step beyond that. 
So instead of just having one fan in our convection ovens, we always have two, always have two fans. Because two fans give us a lot of variability, right? We can really change how the air moves, right? Because we have two fans, we can create different patterns of air numerous times. So in other words, right, I can create four or five different patterns of air when I'm baking so I don't have to worry about the top shelf or the bottom shelf, the middle shelves are even, right? There's another advantage to that, right? That you might not think of. If the air is always moving in a different way, right? How could that be an advantage? If you, uh, what's another way you think that could be an advantage? If it never stops moving, it's constantly circulating. Think about this. Pardon? It is more stable, but here's the other thing. Would anybody in this room with their current oven at their home right now, provided you don't have an M or an E series wall oven or one of our dual fuel, would anybody take and roast a, a filet of salmon at the same time they're baking a tray of chocolate chip cookies? Would anybody do that? Why? What's going to be the outcome? What do you foresee as the outcome? Right, right. No one wants salmon flavored cookies. Nobody does, right? Nobody wants a salmon flavored cookie. Nobody wants a salmon flavored cake. Nobody wants bacon flavored cream puffs, right? Nobody wants those things, right? So we don't ever put those things in the same oven. But if the air never sits still whilst we're baking, right? Or roasting with convection, right? Guess what? There's no way for that flavor to settle from one to another, right? So I can very confidently put a tray in the oven that might be aromatic, shall we say, right? Could be garlic, bacon, salmon, could be all sorts of different things. I'll be very happy to put it in that oven at exactly the same time that I put in chocolate chip cookies. Okay, provided they can bake at the same temperature or cook at the same temperature, I'm not shy to do that in my Wolf convection oven because the air is never still, right? That's what convection can do for you as well, right? So you're on those, those, one of those evenings, you have two things, you're looking at them and you're thinking to yourself, how am I gonna cook these two things? I don't wanna take all the time to bake one, then I have to wait, and bake another so it just extends the process, right? If I could do it at the same time, I'd not only save myself some time, right? But, uh, you know, you'd eat a little sooner, everybody's happier, all those kinds of things. So you can just pop them in there right, together and not have to worry about it because that flavor is never going to settle on top of it. We call that the stinky oven, right? The stinky oven, right? When you have something in there that's really strong, garlic, bacon, all those kinds of things, not going to cross over. So that's what dual fan convection does for you. And we took it again one step further with our M series, the dual vertacross convection system, right? We engineered new fans, right? These are fans that are in our M series oven. They're tall, they're about yay big. They sit in the back corners, right? So instead of just sitting flat against the wall, they're in the back corner. So that air that's being pulled through those fans. Now it's being distributed in an even in greater way because the fans are very tall. They sit in the back and they distribute that air even more evenly. That sounds redundant, right? But it's, it makes a more even distribution of air throughout the oven cavity. So it gives you lots of flexibility once you're cooking, right, in there, right? So dual vertical, vertical convection, right? Really makes a difference. Know this too about all of our ovens. All of our ovens have about 10 different cooking, baking, roasting modes, 10, right? Not just, not just bake 350, right? Right, the universal temperature and method for cooking, right? Just set it at bake 350 and off you go. And you'll read it in cookbooks. Like you'll see a lot of cookbooks. It'll just say, set your oven to 350 degrees, right? Doesn't tell you if it's a mode this or a mode that. You have to know your own oven, right? what you can do. But most cookbooks will just say, oh, just set it to 350 or 375 or 325, whatever it is, right? But we put in 10 different cooking modes because we know that baking a tray of cookies is very different 
than cooking pot roast or roasting a chicken, right? Or making a souffle or baking three trays of anything, right? So we put in 10 different ways to cook that. And here's the cool part is that if you decide some point in the very near future, I hope, to go with Sub-Zero Wolf and Cove, we're gonna bring you back here for an experience. Again, you're gonna have to suffer through me for another couple of hours, but we're gonna teach you all the details of what each one of those modes is gonna be doing when you use it. So you're not gonna be kind of feeling around blind, like, okay, convection roast does what? I have no idea. I mean, it sounds like I should probably cook my turkey in there or something like that, but if you know what your oven is doing, you'll know then how to predict the outcome because you'll know what your oven is helping you do. So knowing it. So that's one of the great things about entering into our little family is that we'll bring you back and we'll train you here on the appliances so you know exactly what they're going to be doing. So when you do come up against that quandary of, well, what should I cook it this way or that way? You're going to have some ammunition to say, ah, but I know I want it to turn out this way. I'm going to use this mode, right? So we're going to prepare you for that by bringing you back. So that's one of the other great things about joining us, right? And coming in, we're going to bring you back here to give you that training. Because I think it really does make a difference for a lot of people to know exactly what that oven is doing. And with 10 different cooking modes, it could be a little daunting, right? When you, when you first time you open, you turn on your dual fuel and you look at all these different ways to cook and you're thinking to yourself, holy smokes, I have no idea where to start, right? What's the difference between this bake and that bake? I mean, there's, it says bake in two different places, right? I mean, how do I know, right? And why does, why does there's, oh wait, there's two roasts too. It's like, holy smokes, how do I know, right? Well, we're going to make sure that you do know. So that's another benefit that you get when you come and join us with that. So that convection system is very, very sophisticated. That oven is, I find that, you know, when you want to bake something like our dessert for tonight, our blueberry buckle that we baked for you guys tonight, right? We bake that in the convection oven. We use that because of that system makes it so even, right? And so just perfectly baked in the middle. You guys know what a buckle is? Anybody know what buckle is? Anybody grew up in the Midwest, right? Ever heard of a buckle? So buckle is like all the great American desserts smashed into one container, right? It has pie, right? So there's a pie crust on the bottom. Then there's pie filling. And then in the middle, there's cake, right? So there's a layer of cake in between two layers of pie filling. And then on top is the crisp topping that you love because it's crunchy and sweet and it has all, so it's all of those great American desserts smashed into one thing, right? So um, it's a fun dessert to make. It's a little bit of work, but it's fun. I think you guys will enjoy it when you get the sample a little bit later. So any questions about convection, right? No? no? Okay. So let's pause for a second. That's the second way that Wolf is the master of heat transfer, is transferring heat in a convection steam oven, using those sophisticated convection systems to give you those different cooking modes so that you can always predict the outcome of what it is that you're going to be preparing, right? But let's segue now a little bit away from cooking and talk about Sub-Zero and food preservation. And we say food preservation for a very specific reason, right? Because food preservation is really what a, this, a refrigerator should be about, right? Let's close my cabinet here. Sub-Zero, right? This is the company that started it all, right? This was the first brand, right? Before we acquired the Wolf cooking line and and obviously we created the Cove line, but Sub-Zero was where it all started back in the 40s, right? And it really is a remarkable tool, right? And it's a remarkable tool because it will literally change the way you shop, the way you cook, and then the way you eat, right? And what is this really designed to do? What's a refrigerator designed to do? Preserve food, right? Keeps things cold, keeps things we hope fresh, right? And a lot of refrigerators can keep things cold, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna keep it fresh, right? Because what's the average amount of time that that head of lettuce that you buy at King Supers is gonna last in your refrigerator? What's, just give me a guess. One 
minute, one week, one week. Okay, one week. All right. What about what about now? It's summer, right? We're getting lots of nice fresh berries. How long are your berries going to last? Couple days. All right. Right. You're smiling. So you obviously, I can say, I, I saw you look at it and you're like, oh yeah, you know, it's my refrigerator, right? So, but that's, right, that's, that's sad because when what happens, right? When the food doesn't look good, we have a couple of things we have to do. A, we probably have to throw it away, right? Because we're just, that white fuzz that's growing on the strawberry or just the lettuce just has no snap, no crunch to it anymore, right? So then we throw it away and then we have to replace it. So now we're buying something twice, right? So it's gonna force us out to spend a little extra money to buy that, right? That's unfortunate. Or we then have to punt, right? And we don't, we, we have everything planned. We had all those nice fresh veggies. We're gonna cook them up and make a great meal with all that. And then all of a sudden we have to change everything. So either we replace them or then we have to order pizza or something because we need to eat, right? And we, we didn't realize that our refrigerator wasn't gonna store it, right? So it's a food preservation tool because it makes food not only fresher, but then it, it expands your horizon in terms of, okay, now I don't have to worry if my food I know is gonna be good. Maybe tonight we're just gonna have salad and we'll cook that other thing tomorrow, right? We know it's gonna be good. We're gonna, you know, all of those things are gonna be preserved in here. So it's gonna kind of help you feel liberated in that you're not thinking, I gotta cook that like now, or it's gonna go bad, right? So what are some of the ways, right, that the technology that we've created for our food preservation system, what are some of those ways that we help ensure your food stays fresh and some of the things that need to happen to keep food fresh? Well, the first thing, right, is we need to make sure that the temperature in here is consistent. That's very important. Temperature and humidity need to be remaining consistent because that's what kills a lot of food in a refrigerator is the temperature does this up and down and the food has no idea whether it's going to be warm or cold and so it's trying to respond to that and humidity is equally as important right because what happens if there's not enough humidity in your refrigerator what what happens the first thing to happen to your produce if there's not enough humidity in your refrigerator that's right, the moisture flees. The moisture flees the lettuce and the strawberries and the, and the carrots and the celery. The refrigerator wants to be humid, but it's not getting enough humidity from its system, so it starts to look for humidity in other places. And the first place it looks is your produce. And it starts pulling the water out of your produce because most produce is you know, like 80 to 90% water. So it's starting to pull that out. So that's when your carrots get Limp and your celery has this weird opaque quality to it, but it doesn't have none, any crunch. Your lettuce starts to shrivel up because it's drying out, right? So humidity is so important, keeping that humidity level up and keeping the temperature level constant. How do we do that? Well, we make sure that in every unit we build, whether there's a freezer in the bottom and a refrigerator on the top, or it's a separate freezer and refrigerator unit side by side, they are always gonna have their own dedicated refrigeration system. In other words, we're not sharing the freezing cold air from the freezer with your refrigerator. We're not doing that. Why? Because what, what's different about the humidity of the air in your refrigerator versus your freezer? The freezer's a lot drier, right? Because what happens if there's too much humidity in your freezer? You get ice and snow and freezer burn, right? You get all those things that, you know, you open the package and you're like, I have no idea what's in here because it just looks like frost. It could be a pork chop. It could be pie dough. It could be shrimp. I have no idea, right? Because I can't see. I mean, it's just ice crystals, right? So that's what happens when you get too much humidity in your freezer. When you get too much, you get too low humidity in your refrigerator. We talked about that already. You're losing. So it's going to start pulling that moisture out of your vegetables. So completely separate refrigeration systems. We never share the air back and forth. Right? So there's not that vent in the back of your refrigerator where we're pushing that cold air from the freezer into your refrigerator because what happens to that? Everything near that vent freezes, right? Everything gets a little frost on it, right? Or you get that lettuce that has that weird translucence to it because it's frozen. The water inside is frozen. So 
That technology exists in every single refrigeration freezer system that we build. There's always separate systems. Doesn't matter if it's under counter refrigerator freezers or it's stand up, it's always going to be different. And we're always going to control that temperature within 0.75 degrees of what you set it at. So if you set it at 36 degrees, it'll never exceed 36.75 and it'll never be lower than 35.25. It'll always live in that one degree and a half, right? So your temperature is going to remain constant. So your food knows, ah, it's going to remain constant, right? And we make it, we, we make it easy for you too, right? Because you're going to buy one of these and you're going to say, okay, how am I going to know how long my produce is supposed to last in my refrigerator? Because I got a week out of my berries, a day out of my, you know, or a week out of my lettuce and a day out of my berries and things like that. I mean, how are you going to prove to me that that's going to last longer? Well, we went so far to test these, right, in Madison. We planted a garden across the street from the factory. In fact, we built a beautiful facility there. It's a huge, I think it's five or six acres of a, of a chef's garden, right, with orchards and all sorts of amazing things. But part of that garden grows one particular type of lettuce. Right? And that lettuce is used not for making salads or anything like that. It's for testing how well our refrigerators perform. Because what we were finding was is that when we were going to the supermarket and buying lettuce, we had no idea how old that lettuce was. You know, you're buying it. There's no, there's no date on this lettuce was harvested on, you know, June 15th, right? You have no idea. So we thought the only way we're going to know that is we're going to grow our own lettuce. So they grew their own lettuce. They'd harvest it, they'd bring it into the test labs, they'd weigh the lettuce right there, right? Mark it down, and they'd put a couple heads in the bureau, they'd put a couple heads in a whirlpool, they'd put a couple heads in a Mila, they'd put it in all of our competitors. And then we would weigh them over successive weeks to see how much moisture is being lost from those heads of lettuce. Over the course of two weeks, the average head of lettuce in a sub-zero lost 9% of its weight, right? It lost 9% of its mass by weight. The average head of lettuce in, the other, in our competitors' refrigerators lost about 35% of their weight, right? So they're losing mass, right? Well, that's how far we had to go to test these to make sure that we were doing it right, right? And then once we'd established sort of what we thought were the, the numbers for all of this produce, we decided we were going to put it on this little plastic card and stick it in everybody's refrigerator so that when you go to the supermarket and you buy some nectarines, you should know, A, those nectarines, they give off ethylene gas, right? They give off ethylene gas. And we found that in our refrigerators systems, in our Sub-Zero, it'll last two to four weeks in the refrigerator. Two to four weeks. Now, some things last a little bit longer. <laughs> some things obviously a little bit shorter. But strawberries, seven to 10 days, right? So if you can get a basket of strawberries to last for 10 days and you want to eat it on the 10th day, it's not that on the 10th day you're looking at it and saying, I got to throw this away. It's on 10th day, you're like, hey, these are still good enough to eat. So I'm going to cut them up and put them on my Cheerios or whatever it is, right? So all of this, and it's listed here, and it tells you not only how long it's gonna last, but where you should be storing it in your refrigerator and whether or not it's susceptible to ethylene gas. Because you guys know what ethylene gas is, right? It's the gas that bananas and tomatoes give off, make things ripen really fast. So if you put something that's very sensitive to ethylene gas next to something that gives off ethylene gas, the thing that's really sensitive ripens like too sweet. I mean, you know, you have like 30 seconds on that and that's how long it's gonna last, right? It's gonna be gone. So. We want to tell you, A, don't put those two things together. So there's an E plus and an E negative on here. So you know not to put those two things together. But it gives you a sense of how long something should last. So the offshoot of this is, right, but you're going to throw away less food because it's not going to go bad. It's going to last longer because you're going to kind of know, you're going to be confident to know that I can get, you know, my kiwi fruit will last six weeks in my refrigerator. Mm -hmm. What's that going to do in the long run? Once you know how things work, what's it going to do for you? It's going to save money. 
That's right. Because you're going to change your buying habits. I mean, you're not going to have to replace stuff as much. How much do you guys think the average American family throws away over the course of a year just because A, doesn't go, it's not good anymore, or B, they just can't identify it? How much? 40%. Let's do it. Give me a dollar figure. What do you think in a year? Kent, what do you think? How much in grocery store bills are you chucking out because it's 1500 Okay. What do you think? 2000 A little low. Kent's get right on the nose. About two thousand dollars is what the average American family throws out every year, just because they can't eat it anymore because it went bad in their fridge. What Sub Zero will tell you is that over the course of a year, we think we can cut that number in half in the first year. And then as your buying habits change, you're going to save even more money, right? You're going to know what can last and what you guys like and how long and all that kind of stuff. Right? So think about that. <laughs> When somebody says, oh yeah, this is X number of dollars to buy one of these things. Think about five years from now, if you've saved $700 a year, just because you didn't throw that food away, it's all coming back to you because you made that upfront investment. So I think that's pretty smart. Here's another way that we've engineered this unit to keep your food fresher longer. We talked about the ethylene gas, right? Well, if we can take that ethylene gas out of the air in your refrigerator, that's going to make food last longer as well. But what else might be floating around in the air in your refrigerator that you might not want in there? What are some of the other things you might find, you know, like is anybody going to leave that salmon that I was going to roast with my, with my uh, uh, cream puffs or cookies in the oven? Are they ever going to leave that salmon uncovered in your refrigerator? Anybody ever going to do that? No. And you're going to not do that because... It smells. I don't want my refrigerator to smell like fish, right? Yuck, right? But so we want to be able to get odors out of it. How do we normally get odors out of refrigerator? Baking soda, right? The universal odor filter in a, right? Nothing against the whoever owns Arm and Hammer, but I think there's a better way to do that, right? So this is a great story. You know, I told you that. Sub-Zero is based in Madison, Wisconsin, one of the other major institutions in Madison, Wisconsin is the University of Wisconsin. My father did his graduate work at the University of Wisconsin many, many moons ago. Anyway, the University of Madison is there and one, the uh, University of Wisconsin is there in Madison. One day, there were two engineers, they happened to be at a football game together. One of those engineers worked for Sub-Zero and Wolf. The other engineer happened to be a professor at the University of Wisconsin, and he was working on a contract right, that was given to the university by NASA. And NASA had asked the University of Wisconsin to help them develop an air filtration system for the International Space Station. Because they needed to upgrade the space station's filtration system to make sure the air was just as pure and clean as they possibly could make it up there on the space station. So the guys at the University of Wisconsin had come up with a technology where you use titanium dioxide crystals and a UV light. When the UV light is shown onto those titanium dioxide crystals. The titanium dioxide absorbs odors, bacteria, mold, mildew, and in 2020, viruses from the air. Sucks it out of the air, stores it in the titanium dioxide, right? So that's what they were using on the space station. That engineer from, the, from, from Sub-Zero said, you know, that gives me an idea. Maybe we can create a filtration system for the air in a refrigerator to take all of those things out of the air because that will make your food last longer. Why do you think cheese goes bad in your refrigerator? Because what happens to the cheese, right? cheese is a living thing. So when you put mold spores or mildew spores on cheese, they grow, <laughs> right? They're like eating, they're, they're, they're like, woohoo, this is great. I mean, we're kind of having a symbiotic relationship here. And that, that's going to grow, right? So if we can pull that out of the air, cheese lasts longer, right? So what they did was they created this little box. And this little box sits in the back of your refrigerator. And you can hear it. Inside the box, titanium dioxide. Also inside the box is a very small UV light. Every 20 minutes, the refrigerator switches this on, pulls the air through the filter, the light shines on the titanium dioxide, 
and the odors and the mold and the mildew and the bacteria are trapped in this little box. Once a year, you replace this filter, right? I think you have to replace your baking soda like every month. So this is a little, you, know, you don't have to remember as much, right? And the nice part is the refrigerator will tell you, hey, please replace the filter, right? That's one of the nice things about this. So this is another way that we're engineering this to preserve your food longer, right? Just sits right there in the back. Now, we talked a little bit, and I'm gonna, I forgot to give you this, my favorite little demonstration, but we talked a little bit about the humidity level, right, in your freezer versus your refrigerator. And we talked, Kent was telling us, you know, if you, if you have too much humidity in your freezer, you get ice crystals, right? You get all sorts of snow in your refrigerator. It is now the 24th day of August 2020, 25th. Sorry, I'm going to cut myself short there. 25th day of August 2020. We opened this facility in November of 2018. On December 1st, 2018, I went to King Supers and I bought this container of ice cream and I threw away the lid. So this ice cream has been open for almost two years in this freezer. It's never come out except when I bring it out for this demonstration. And if you guys can see, and I'll just kind of run it by you, but see if you can find me an ice crystal on the top of the ice cream. Right? Now, I will tell you right now, the ice cream has a slightly cottony texture because obviously there's a moisture in here. So the freezer is pulling a little of the moisture out, but there's no ice crystals, right? It's, you could eat this, right? You could literally just take that very top layer off and dig down and put this on top of your blueberry buckle. Although I made you some ice cream, so you don't have to eat this. Um, but again, Almost two years. They say that in our Chicago showroom, they had an ice cream cake that lasted seven years, uncovered, never covered in the freezer. Never got any freezer burn. They ate it seven years later. From what I'm told, and I did speak to somebody who was actually there at the moment they ate it, said the frosting was a little dry, he said, but the cake inside was perfect. So again, good example of how long Sub-Zero can keep things fresh in your freezer. And most of us are never gonna leave our ice cream uncovered in the freezer. Now there's none of those air filters in the freezer. We don't put the air filter in the freezer. We just put it in your refrigerator because that's where the mold and mildew is gonna have the greatest amount of impact in keeping the quality of your products um, up to snuff, right? And one of the other things I wanna mention about Sub-Zero, and I always mention this, and if you get a chance, if you haven't already at one point, but if you wanna go downstairs tonight before you go home, Lynn or myself can show you the Pro 48 or the Pro 36. Those are our Pro Series refrigerators. They're a little different than our columns and a little different than our classics, but they are 100% stainless steel, inside and out. They have two doors, they have four drawers, right? They are amazing pieces of machinery. They're beautiful, but that's the point. They're beautiful in the sense of the way that they are constructed. One of the things about our product that I think is really important to know is just the amount of care and craftsmanship that goes into the manufacture of these. These are not just built, yes, we use robots. There is no question. We have a robotic assembly line in Madison, but a lot of it is done by hand. I mean, proprietary sanding belts to make our stainless steel exactly the same, right? So the stainless steel on your hood is always gonna match the stainless steel on your dishwasher, which is gonna match the stainless steel on your Sub-Zero. It's always gonna match. It's never gonna have a different grain. It's never gonna have a different color ever. All that's done by hand, right? Those are people who are artisans at this, and I know artisans are probably an overused word in today's food culture, but it really is an artisan. You have to sit down and TIG weld these and make the welds perfectly smooth and then sand them so they are completely finished. And the reason I bring up the, 30, the Pro 48 and the Pro 36 is because when you look at them, I would like to see if you can find an exposed screw head, an unfinished seam, something where you might catch your fingers and cut yourself on some unfinished metal. You won't find it. You can look, you won't find it. 
So just look at one of those tonight before you go home and appreciate the amount of work and artistry that goes into the manufacture of these appliances because it really is remarkable. It's not just, I'm not just saying that because, you know, it's just part of a thing. These guys really know what they're doing and they take a lot of pride in it. So it's just, I think you have to recognize that when you don't see that all the time now where people take real, real pride in what they're doing and how they build it. So I would suggest if you're here and you get a chance, go have a look at one of those. They're just gorgeous to look at as well. Not everybody wants an 800 pound refrigerator. I understand that, but they are fun to look at, right? They're really, they're really fun to look at. So again, Sub-Zero, it will change the way you cook because it will make food last longer, open up options to you. You're never gonna have to think to yourself, oh, we gotta eat this right now, even though we don't want to. It's going to go bad. It's really going to change how you think about fresh product. And it, it really does make a difference. So any questions about Sub-Zero? No? Yes, Kip. Not really. The average Sub-Zero uses about the same amount of energy as a 75-watt light bulb in a day. So it's fairly low in terms of it. Now, not all of our... Products are energy star rated, but most of them are. So um, you aren't gonna have a huge energy consumption on this just because a lot of the reason that the humidity is able to be kept at a very high level is the way our drawers seal, the way that air, that air is transferred into those high humidity drawers. So that humidity is transferred, but it's mostly about how those drawers are actually sealing really, really shut, right? And that we don't see that little slidey thing in our refrigerator that says, oh, this high humidity, low humidity. That humidity is purposely pumped into those drawers, so you don't have to worry about anything like that. So. All right, okay. So let's come back over here now, and I will switch the camera so everybody can see. And we're gonna go back to left camera. See if I get, oh, I did get it right, look at me. All right, let's go to four. All right, so let's talk a little bit about my favorite way to cook is using gas, right? The gas um, on our, this is our dual fuel range. So dual fuel obviously was um, pretty much introduced right, right around the beginning of, the, of this century. So around 2000, um, Wool started introducing a dual fuel range. And a dual fuel range just means that you have electric ovens and you have a gas cooktop, right? So you have the best of both worlds. Gas is a little more, uh, like as I said, you can, you, you can see your heat, you can control it very, very uh, precisely, um, but in, uh, in the electric ovens, you're given a lot more flexibility in terms of the way that you're baking, the way you're roasting and all that. So it gives you the flexibility of both, which I really, really appreciate. Now this is obviously a big 60 inch range. So I've got my dual stack burners, I've got my infrared griddle, I've got my char broiler, got a lot of different options here that you can that you can put you can put you know if you want eight burners and just one griddle you can do that right can't do 12 burners or 10 burners can't do 10 burners on a 60 that would be a lot of burners let me tell you i don't anybody unless you're going to be a short order cook for your whole neighborhood you probably don't need 10 burners but you have a lot of different options with gas i mean you can have like i said like a griddle a double griddle you can have a char broiler if anybody Anybody know what a French top is? Have you guys looked at what a French top is, right? We're like one of the few uh, residential manufacturers that makes a French top, right? Um, if you are interested in a French top, come speak to me. We will try to talk you out of it. Um, but, um, and it's only because it's not, it's not the way that most Americans like to cook, right? If I can talk to you, if you're really interested in a French top, let's talk about a double griddle because you're gonna be much happier with that than a French top, but anyway. But we still make a French top, which is a unique cooking, and it really comes from Wolf's resident, or excuse me, commercial heritage. That's really where it comes from, right? A French top is right out of a restaurant, right? So if you are wanting to cook like you're in a French restaurant, that's going to be for you. But that Wolf carries that forward now to our residential line, and a lot of the features that you see in our gas cooking really come straight out of that commercial heritage, right? That's really important to us is that you understand that this was not, you know, this isn't an upgraded, you know, residential appliance. This is a slightly downgraded commercial appliance. That's really what it's about. 
Um, so when you're cooking on it, you're getting powerful BTUs so that when you need to do some wok cooking and really crank something out or you want to boil that pasta water very, very quickly, you're, you have power at your disposal. But to my way of thinking, what's really important about this is that you have an enormous amount of control over the heat. Because as I said before, you give somebody 35,000 BTUs and I almost guarantee you that for at least the first six weeks that they use that burner, they're gonna burn everything, right? Because it's just, that's a ton of energy, right? So if you overheat that pan, your oil denatures, and the next thing you know, your garlic is burnt in less than a nanosecond, right? So it's better to have control. And I think that's where Wolf really excels. Yes, we give you power, right? You got a 20,000 BTU burner over here. That's gonna give you plenty of power. You wanna brown something, you wanna sear some tuna, something like that. But what we also give you is on every single burner in our dual stack burner technology, these are really two burners in one, right? And when you have power right here, right? You have your high power burner down here. This is an 18,000 BTU burner. Let me just get this on. But that gives you the ability to, right? You're, you're sauteing, you're doing all this. You have all that power. It's right here. And you, like I said, infinite flame height control, right? all the way down. But secondarily, every burner has a secondary simmer burner. Have you guys looked at other appliance brands or have you just looked at ours? Have you just... So you might know that on certain appliance brands, you're given like one burner here and one burner here and those are your simmer burners. So if you're simmering a sauce or a soup or something that you wanna just keep warm, you can only use those two burners because everything else is gonna kind of boil it, right? But on all of these, there is a secondary burner, and I have a completely secondary system, separate gas valve, separate gas line, separate control. So when I wanna go down nice and low, right, to hold something and not worry, right, cooking with confidence, being able to predict how something is gonna come out, I have now all those choices on these burners, right? All of these burners have that ability to run a secondary this one is, must be dirty back there because it's clicking. Um, but all of those give me that choice. So I could simmer six different soups here if I wanted to. And if I wanted to stick it on a low griddle, I can do that as well. So it gives me an enormous amount of control. Now I have varying low temperatures so that when I want to just brown something, I want to cook something slowly, simmer, poach, whatever it might be, I have that control. I'm not limited by just two burners to sear on, right? And that amount of control extends a long, long way, right? Because if I can, where's my spatula, all right? Because if I know, right, that I can set something on a burner and just let it cook and not have to worry about it, I have peace of mind, I can go do other things in the kitchen. That's important, right? So this burner over here is my melt burner. Can everybody agree what's in this pot? Looks like, say it out loud, Chocolate chips, right? Chocolate chips. Now, just so you guys know, this burner is on. It's been on since 3.30 this afternoon. That's when I turned it on. The chocolate chips have been on that burner the entire time, right? So we can all see that these are chocolate chips, right? It's a no problem. All right. Hold that. Okay. Stir. <laughs> so what she has proven to us is that those chocolate chips, right? Whilst you can stop now, you're good, you're good. Unless you want the, no. So those chocolate chips, they were liquid. They just looked like chocolate chips. They've been sitting on that burner, looking like chocolate chips, but really what they are is melted chocolate disguised as a chocolate chip, because they were 100% melted and held. Now I can leave them on that burner I don't know. Let's see. Today's Tuesday. We'll just leave it on till Friday or Saturday. I'm here Saturday. So Saturday, we can just leave it on that whole time. It won't scorch. It won't burn. It'll never go click, 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 turn off, turn on. It'll just hold that temperature indefinitely. So think about what you can do with that. You make a sauce. You make, you know, you have something really delicate, hollandaise sauce, a butter sauce, anything like that. I need to hold it, right? to serve later and just put it on my melt burner back there and just let it go and not have to worry about it. And it will hold that as long as I need it to. 
I mean, in fact, one of our local dealers left that burner on for four days with a pot of chocolate chips on it. And the chocolate chips looked like chocolate chips four days after they went on to the burner. So that's an, another way of showing how much control this gas range can give you, right? And what this technology will do. One of my other favorite ways to des describe what this gas technology is, is my infrared griddle. People ask me this all the time. They say, Ben, you have two appliances that you, can, you can't live without. What are those two things? My convection steam oven is one. This is the second. This infrared griddle, and infrared's a funny word, I know, because it sounds like it's some kind of space age thing, right? But it's not. It's just a gas burner over underneath a half inch thick alloy steel plate, right? Which holds heat magnificently well, right? Transfers it very, very evenly, right? And consistently. It has a thermostatic control. So when I want to cook on here, I know that it will not exceed 350 or 375 degrees. That's one of the great things about it. I can just throw stuff on there and know that if 350 is the perfect temperature, it's just going to stay right there. It's not going to overheat. It's not going to overbrown. It's not going to do any of those things. So this is a very, very similar, in fact, in some ways it's better than most commercial griddles, right? Absolutely, it, this is phenomenal in terms of how, so people look at this all the time and they say, well, what do I need that for? I make pancakes on Sundays, like once a month, right? Why would I give up my real estate for that? Because it's more than just making pancakes on it. Like I said, you can sear on here, you can stir fry on here. If you want to use it as a holding position for a pot of something, you can do that as well. So you can do so many more things on this griddle than you can. And then you have to ask yourself, how many times am I going to use four burners simultaneously? Six, six burners. Anybody ever use six burners all at the same time? I don't, even in a restaurant. I mean, unless I was, you know, cooking for 500 people, then we needed six burners at once, but most people, they're never going to. So let's give it a little example of this. Make sure. So obviously this is gas powered, right? It's a little narrower in this model, right? It's only about 11 inches wide, where that is about 13 inches wide. Um, but this has the thermostat where you can actually see the numbers. 150, 350, whatever it might be. So it's a little easier to kind of know what your temperature is. The other thing is this is a thicker plate. It's a non-stick, essentially, it's like a cast iron skillet, right? So when you're using this, you're not having to worry about using as much seasoning, right? Or much, as much cooking with oil, you can literally just cook right on it and it's gonna be very, very even. And where's my, there it is. So it's very similar in the teppanyaki that it, it cooks much the same, but it gives you a little more browning because of the nature of the, the steel that's on here the alloy steel as opposed to a stainless steel. Okay. It's all gas. So it's called an infrared because underneath it is a ceramic burner. That ceramic burner, when it heats up, turns red. So we call it an infrared burner because it's radiant heat that's coming up from that ceramic plate, which makes this heat very, very even on the, on the, the cooking surface itself. So in this case, we're just going to add a little bit of clarified butter, which is has all the benefits of butter and doesn't burn, which makes it really nice. And then we've got some potato cakes that we're going to brown off here. So you can just see how nicely and evenly this cooks. All right. So again, this is where the peace of mind comes in. You can set them on there and you can step away and do something else. So our charbroiler is the same burner technology just underneath an indoor grill, right? And it has some heat zones to it as well. So when you want to slow, you know, grill some onions, you can just use the back of the grill back here to do that. So again, again, I'm not the biggest indoor grill fan, but I find that this one works rather nicely for those moments when I really need to grill something, but I don't want to go ignite my 54 inch 
outdoor grill to just cook a few onions, right? I don't need to do that. So I like to use my charbroiler for that. But again, directs the heat really nicely. It gives me the results that I would like while we're, while we're grilling. So you can just see how even these will be. And again, just like I was talking about with the teppanyaki, it gives us that little lesson in the best ways to cook. Heat the grill or heat the griddle so it's nice and hot. Add the oil, immediately add the food, and then don't play with it. Let it brown. Right? Let the appliance do its work. It's going to hold that temperature very, very evenly and consistently. So you're going to find that it is going to brown everything the way you want it to without having to spend a lot of time monkeying about. And that's really what, you know, makes, see, look how nice already it's starting to turn out. I'm getting some nice browning on there. You can see that on the thing that we just let that sit. And again, it's going to be that way all the way across. We're not going to have to shuffle things around. We're just going to let it cook gently there. So, okay. So are you getting a little sense about why this gas gets so, there's so many options that you have with gas, right? Whether it's these two modules in the middle, but you always have these burners and all of our gas burners are designed exactly the same way. It's not like you have to buy the top of the line dual fuel 60 inch range to get these burners. They're on a cooktop downstairs. They're on all of our gas appliances. They're all the same. They're all engineered the same, they're just slightly different BTUs, right? So that's one of the nice things about it. You don't have to go to the very top of the line to get that technology in your burners, right? That's the way we build gas burners and it really will make a difference when you're cooking because you're going to feel that confidence and that's, I think, what really frees you up in the kitchen to do fun things is when you're just confident that, that your appliances are gonna behave the way that they're supposed to. And so I'm just gonna turn those a little earlier, so, right? Any questions about the gas, right? No? So, yes. So, good question. Best thing I can tell you is I recommend the best, the most number of plies of metal that you can afford. In other words, if you can afford a seven ply set of pans, right? And seven plies means there's seven individual layers of metal built into this pan, right? In other words, there's the exterior layers and there's five different bonded layers in between of different types of metal, right? That's gonna give you the most even and consistent heat distribution through that pan. The most number of, that you can afford, that's the way to go. If it's five, it's five. If it's three, it's three. Just knowing that the more, the, the more layers, the more even that heat's gonna be. So All Clad is a great brand, DeMeyer is a great brand. You know, I get a, I've had somebody the other day asking me about those made in pans, right? She was swearing by them. She says they're the best pan she's ever owned, right? She loves them. I'm like, really? I'm going to have to try one because I've never even picked one up. So I have no idea what they're like. But she swore by them, said they were the greatest pans ever. She has that and she has all clad and she says you can't tell the difference. So, and I don't know. You sell things on Instagram, it makes me a little nervous, right? I'm not really sure, right? But that's the best place to buy my cookware is from somebody you know, hitting my feed on Instagram because I like to look at pictures of food, right? So, I mean, I know how those things work, but um, anyway, but can you see how nice and even this, this griddle is in the, you know, it's interesting, this one, I didn't get as much oil back there, so it's not quite as brown, so I may have to slide that one over. It's less the, less the griddle than it is me, right? So, all right. Okay, so gas. Again, that commercial heritage really comes through when you talk about Wolf gas cookery, right? But let's talk about the last means of heat transfer. Let's talk about the convection steam oven and what that can do, right? So everybody kind of made that nodding, you know, acknowledgement at the beginning when I said convection steam, because everybody obviously heard a little bit about a convection steam oven. What have you guys heard about convection steam that makes it interesting to you? What is it? It's quicker, that's right, right? What else have you heard? Or what else do you think? Absolutely, from a reheating point of view, right? Because what's worse than reheating something in the microwave, right? Defrosting something in the microwave, that's the only thing that's worse. Defrosting is worse than reheating, in, a, in my opinion. Yes, it's a great reheating tool. Now, what is it gonna be that makes it such a, wonderful tool for both 
the speed of the cooking, the reheating, what's going to be that the difference? It's going to be moisture. It's going to be steam, right? Obviously, if the oven can produce steam, it's going to be, you know, giving us that advantage. And why do you think that steam has such an advantage? What more heat, right? True, it's more heat, but it's also the nature of that heat. And when I say that, what I mean is, is that steam, right, is a vastly more efficient method of heat transfer than dry air. Example, right, if I walk over to this oven, right, this oven, let's say this oven is on, it's 400 degrees, right, and I reach in and I take something out, right, I'm okay as long as I covered my hand, not gonna be burnt, right? But if I walk over here, right, am I sticking my hand in that? No. How hot is this? Very hot. But in actual temperature, it's only 210 degrees. That was 400 degrees. I can put my hand in a 400 degree oven. I can put my hand over this grill. It's not pleasant, but it's hot, right? But 210 degree steam versus 110 degree or 400 degree dry air is a very different thing. This burns me and I avoid it. This does not. What that teaches me is that this is transferring the heat from the steam to my flesh much more efficiently than that oven is. So now the reason it cooks faster is because the minute steam comes in contact with the food that you're cooking, it's cooking, right? It's transferring heat very, very quickly. So that when I put something into the convection steam oven to cook and I'm using steam as part of my cooking process, now I'm cooking immediately. And that means that in most cases, I never have to preheat the oven. Only about 15% of the time do I need to preheat my convection steam oven when I wanna cook something in it. The rest of the time, I put the food in a cold oven, I set it and off it goes. And it cooks faster because the steam accelerates the cooking process. The steam is also adding moisture. So now I'm getting something really delicious, right? Because it's moist and not overcooked and it's coming out from the oven much faster. So it really does make a difference when we're using steam, right? And this is not just a steamer, right? That's what a lot of people think. Who had one of those little like flying saucer things that you used to put in a pot and you'd throw the broccoli on top of it and the steam would come up through the holes and you'd steam your broccoli, right? That was, that, you still have one. Good for you. You know, you probably can sell that on eBay for a lot of money. Um, Cause I don't even know if they make those things anymore. But we sort of upgraded the steamer, right? So if you want to steam your asparagus, cause you know that what's great about steaming vegetables? There's no fat, right? What else? You're not losing any nutrients, right? You're not boiling them out, right? Even when you roast vegetables, you're losing a little bit of nutrient, right? A little bit. Not as much as when you boil it, but certainly when you're less than when you're steaming it. So when you steam it, you're saving all those nutrients and it's cooking really, really gently in its own juices, right? Hold on, I gotta press a button. So, let him go by. So steam, right? When we're doing vegetables, it's retaining those nutrients, it's keeping things bright and fresh and green. Right, really looks nice and it's fast. I don't have to boil a pot of water on the stove. Even if I have induction, right? I don't have to take the time to boil the water. I can just literally throw those vegetables in there and six minutes later, I got perfectly cooked vegetables, right? So it's a steamer, but it's also a combination of it. It's using steam in conjunction with dry convection air to create a great environment for the bread that you had tonight was all baked in the convection steam oven, right? And I could tell you right now, that bread took me active time. No, I don't know, less than 20 minutes, right? Very, very quickly. The oven does all the work. The oven does the work of deciding how much steam, what temperature, how long it's going to take, all that stuff. The oven will do that for you. So it gives you a chance to look like a pro baker, but all you have to do is hit a button or two. And once you know how to do that, it's super easy, right? So the convection steam oven can give you that choice as well. But it really is, can be a very clean and efficient way to cook. What, tell me this, if you're planning a dinner party, is the most 
your agonizing thing that you have to deal with when you have a dinner party? What's timing, right? You want the food to come out of that oven at exactly the same time. And you're struggling with that. You're thinking, well, you know, this. But if I could tell you right now that there's an appliance, the convection steam oven, that will take the most important part of that meal, right, and produce it so that it's done exactly when you want it to be done, to the exact internal temperature that you want it to be done to, right, so that you don't have to even think about it. You just put it in there. You know you're going to cook, you know, a prime rib or whatever it is. Just put it in there. It's going to come out exactly at that time, right? CSO can do that for you. You can literally set it so that that roast will be done at exactly, well, it's now 7.32. It was done two minutes ago, which is exactly when I wanted it to be done. It was right at 7.30. So if I have that as a tool, now I can rest a little easier while I'm browning off my potato cakes, right? Or cooking my onions. All of these can be done without having to worry that my roast is not going to be done in time and all of those things. Now, what's, what happens when, you know, you're having a, a dinner party and you've got your friends over and you haven't seen them in months and months or years or something like that? You want to spend some time with them, right? You don't want to be running around the kitchen and doing all those things. But you, sometimes you spend so much time with them that you get a little sidetracked and you forget that you programmed your roast to be done at 7.30 and you look at your watch and oh, it's 10 to 8. It's been 20 minutes. My roast is going to be two shades beyond medium rare. And that's going to be, I'm going to look like a total buffoon because I totally overcooked it, right? Convection steam oven is a technology that comes right out of the food service business. It was created for big banquet style hotels and convention centers and dare, I dare say large restaurants that needed to prepare large amounts of food, right? That needed to be held until it was ready to be served. So the convection steam oven right now is taking that roast that I've prepared for you that was done three minutes ago and it's holding it at exactly the temperature that I wanted it cooked to. And it will hold it that way until I want to take it out and slice it. And it'll just do that for me because I'm left the probe inserted. It's in the oven. It's going to hold that temperature. It's not going to overcook it. It's not going to let it get cold or any of those things. It's just going to hold it at that temperature. That's what it does. That's what it was designed to do. Not only was it designed to cook it to that exact internal temperature to be done at exactly the moment I want it to be done, but it'll take care of holding it for me for a little bit longer if I want to spend some more time on the patio or wherever it is or somebody's delayed at the airport or something like that, right? So that's, that's what it'll do. So these guys, you guys can sit down there. All right, so let's have a look at how the convection steam oven did with your dinner. Knock on the door. Anyway, so you just program it. You tell it when you want it to be done. Right on the CSO. So, there's the probe, comes out. It's out of the oven. So you can see it's, I seared it a little bit, right? But you can see there's no excess moisture on the tray. And when you slice it, it's going to be this exact temperature from one end to the other. I guarantee you, you're not going to have your mother-in-law saying, oh, don't you have the well-done piece on the end, right? It's not going to be that way. The end is going to be just as medium. Here, I'll just show you. So it's just as medium rare on the end as it is in the middle. Right? And it's all cooked to exactly that same temperature. So unfortunately, it does prohibit you from having the ability to say, oh, well, this part is medium well, and this part's medium, and this part. No, it's all going to be the same, right? So however you like it, it's going to cook it to that exact 
specification whenever you want it that way. And you can just see how nice and beautiful that color is from side to side. You know, it's not just one little bit that's going to be medium rare. The whole thing is going to be that way. So it really does take that worry off your plate. And it can do so much more than just this. As you've seen, we've made jars of preserves right in there. We've baked bread. You can bake cakes, cookies. You can do your vegetables. You can cook your seafood. You can sous vide cook. You can do so many things in your convection steam oven, right? That you probably never thought you would ever think of doing but you can do it all in that oven. And what you see here, this stack of ovens right here with the large M series, 30 inch below the convection steam oven, this is what we're finding more and more people are moving towards. Instead of doing this traditional double wall oven, they're going to this configuration. Because as I said at the top of the, the event, 80% of the time, you're gonna use that oven because you don't have to preheat it and it adds steam and makes your cooking just a little more moist, just a little bit better. It's gonna really help you in terms of how you prepare the food. So really it is becoming, I don't think it's a gadget. I don't think it's a, it's something that you would say, oh, this is a, this is a, you know, this is a flash in the pan. This is a fluke. It's none of those things. This is gonna be around for a while. And you're gonna see more and more people with convection steam ovens because it really can improve how you cook, right? Because it can add that moisture and give you that flexibility that you will never get with a traditional oven, right? Having that steam as a function, it really makes a difference. So, any questions about convection steam? It's a great question, right? I think it's, a, I think it's less steep than most people assume it's going to be. You don't need to relearn. You need to know what the oven is doing. And then again, predict the outcome of how you would like it to look. Once you know that outcome in your mind, you can then use the modes in the oven to reach that outcome by just knowing what the oven's gonna be doing, what's best for this, what's not best for that, right? So I don't think the learning curve is that steep. Um, I think there's a little trial and error with it. In other words, you might have a recipe that you really loved preparing in your traditional oven, and you might say, well, how am I gonna adjust for the convection steam? Don't change the temperature, pick the right mode, but as you said, it's going to cook it faster. So always check it early, right? Use your probe that comes with the oven so you can guarantee that internal temperature is gonna be the same and it really will not be a difficult thing to adjust to, it really won't. I, probably more um, adjustment comes in the forms of what baked items can go in and out and what really does, where does steam benefit and where does steam not really make any difference whatsoever to the outcome. So I think that's really a little more problematic, but not hard. It's really not hard. So, so along with your, um, your goat cheese and potato cakes with the beef, there's a roasted eggplant puree, right? Which is a roasted eggplant, roasted garlic, tomatoes, sun-dried tomatoes, fresh basil, a little balsamic vinegar, all those things. And then you have your grilled onions with some arugula and then the lemon um, olive oil. Um, which is an Italian um, specialty, which is lemon olive oil pressed. Um, and so that's everything. Yes, Lynn. Um, if you have a convection steam oven, do you still really need a traditional oven? Um, the only limiting factor for a traditional, for a convection steam oven is going to be its size. Um, you won't be able to put a 23 pound turkey in your convection steam oven. You can do an 18 to 20 pound turkey without any trouble whatsoever, but large is going to prevent it. It only, can't do three things. It can't broil, it can't heat up your coffee, and it can't pop popcorn. That's where the line, that's where the, that list ends, right there. You can't broil your, your French onion soup. But if you need a larger oven cavity, then a traditional oven would probably be in order. But if you're not doing a lot of entertaining and you're not doing large roasts and things like that, a convection steam oven can do just about everything a large oven can do, again, except broil. So that would be my answer to that question about that. I think it's a nice setup to have both because um, if you're going to roast your turkey in your convection steam oven, you're going to need somewhere to make your sweet potato casserole or something like that. Yes, Ken? Why not just make the top Good question. 
And that question we get a lot. Kent's question was about why not make it larger, right? Why not have a larger cavity for a convection steam oven? Um, two things. One, the reservoir size would need to be much larger to produce enough steam to fill a large cavity with an, in enough steam to cook evenly and consistently. And two, it's very difficult to get that larger cavity without having a very, very powerful boiler and large boiler with enough steam that we've just discovered that it just doesn't make a lot of sense to make a really big cavity for that. So we've kept it small, right, in that sense. Um, it also makes it more efficient as a steamer, right, to keep it in a smaller size. So then when you want to use it as purely a steamer, whether you're doing seafood or vegetables or um, canning or something like that, you're going to get a better steam content in a smaller cavity. Does that answer your question? Because, I mean, you're right. I mean, other people have asked me the same question. It's like, make it bigger, make it bigger. The problem is it wouldn't be as efficient. I mean, in the ones in, it's interesting, a um, couple sessions ago, we had a gentleman here who, he's re he was retired now, but during his career, he was an installer for appliances and equipment for a contractor that built ships for the United States Navy. And he installed combi steam ovens on aircraft carriers and he said we had to put in ducting for the steam that was about six to eight inches in diameter right to get all that steam into those big ovens right so he said he remembers when they were literally the size of a small refrigerator that's how large the ovens were and they would have on an aircraft carrier he said they would have like 50 of them all in a row so they would prepare meals for Three or four thousand people simultaneously. So, any more questions about convection steam? Lynn, do you have any more questions from the online um, group? Okay. You were you were furiously answering the question. How does everybody enjoy this? Uh, as I was here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> of course. Okay, so great question. Kip's question is about how do gas cooktops or an induction cooktops compare in terms of durability and reliability? Um, great question. So first thing you guys should all know about all Sub-Zero Wolf & Co. products, we build everything with the full expectation that they will last 20 years. That includes the dishwashers. We fully believe that if you buy a dishwasher in 2020, in 2040, you'll still be washing your dishes in your dishwasher. And to that end, right, we will promise you that if you buy this dishwasher this year, and for some unknown reason, we decide to stop making that dishwasher in 2021, right, a year after you bought it, you can be guaranteed that for 20 years, we will still have parts, factory produced parts for your dishwasher 20 years into the future. And that's true with everything we make. We discontinue something in 2020, we're gonna make parts until 2040, right? Because that's how long we expect it to last. We expect the same thing from both of our cooktops, right? Now, will I, can I tell you that that cooktop over there, that's a glass cooktop, right? Is not susceptible to things like chips, cracks, breakage, things like that. I couldn't tell you that in good conscience and say, oh yeah, it won't break. I've seen them break. You know why they break? Because people drop things on them, right? Like from a, from a height. Like so right now, if one of the filters from that hood dropped out of there and fell onto that glass cooktop, there's a very, very high probability it will crack and it will break. So from a durability standpoint, the glass, if you treat it right and you're not banging on it or anything like that, it's going to last you for 20 years. These, absolutely they'll last. For that i mean there is no question about our durability we build things to last i mean if you know a little bit about our warranty program out of the box for both uh, wolf cove and sub-zero well they're all slightly different but for wolf um your warranty um is two years bumper to bumper right when you get it home right if you have it installed by a factory certified installer we in, we add a year to that warranty it's five years or six years on the parts right, are all warranted to that. Now on sub-zeros, we give you a 12-year warranty on the 
sealed system parts. So your compressor, your evaporator, all those high, inner, high big ticket parts, right? If one of those fails in the first 12 years, all you do is pay for the labor, the parts are going to be paid for. And all of our warranties um, are like that. And they all also extends to all of our Cove dishwashers. The same thing is true as well. So we do warranty them. We do truly believe that they will last you for 20 years. In fact, I had a young lady in here the other day. Um, she was interested in getting a new Sub-Zero. I said, really? She said, I have, I have one. She said, oh, that's great. She said, I've had it for 26 years. She said, I'm just, I need to replace it. She said, it still works just fine. She said, but I just, my kitchen needs to be updated a little bit. So she was going from a, a classic design with the louvers on top to a column design. So she was going to switch those out and get a different model. Um, but it was basically going to be fit into the same opening. But yeah, she had a 28 year old Sub-Zero. And we've had people who come in and who have Sub-Zeros that are close to 40 years old. Um, and they're just replacing them, not because they're broken, but because they just look 40 years old. So um, they really, they, they will last. The durability is there. Um, again, the only thing that's going to cause your induction to go uh, south on you is, it, again, some sort of chip or crack. And that can be replaced. I mean, you can replace the, the top on that pretty easily. Um, but we actually have one downstairs that you'll probably notice on your way out is cracked. That's because somebody dropped one of these on it. Fortunately, it wasn't an employee. It was a customer. So we couldn't, couldn't very well. Um, couldn't hold her accountable for it, but anyway. <laughs> anyway, so um, any other questions? I mean, so let me just um, say to our online guests, thank you so, so much for joining us tonight. I hope this has been instructive and informative for you. Um, should you have any questions, um, reach out um, to Lynn. She can certainly um, direct any questions that need to come to me through that, um, and we're happy to answer them. And again, if you haven't had a chance to make an appointment and come down and visit the showroom and have a, an in-depth um, consultation with one of our showroom consultants, I would very heartily encourage it. Um, definitely make an appointment so we can give you all the time that you deserve when you come in. Um, and who knows, you might show up on a day when something is being prepared and we'll be happy to share some of the food that we're making for, for that group. But again, thank you again so much for joining us. And we're going to let those people who are online um, sign off because that's pretty much the end of the presentation before we um, serve the dessert. So anyway, thanks again for joining us and we hope to see you here in the showroom really soon. So, you have a question? <laughs>